We're going to start with um, our first panel on election reform. Um, this panel will be moderated by George Albro, who will be joined by Susan Lerner of Common Cause, New York State Assemblyman Robert Carroll, uh, New York State Assemblyman Brian Kavanaugh, and Yes, yes. Um, so again, each uh, the, the panel will say a few words and we will also discuss from the floor. Without further ado. Oh, please do. Sorry. Highly encouraged. Two things, it's very important. One is, uh, uh, we want us to keep uh, Puerto Rico in our prayers, but the U.S. Virgin Islands are getting left out of the discussion. So we need to make sure we keep them looking up. They are just as devastated, if not more, in some of those islands, and they do need assistance, so please keep them up. And the second thing I forgot to say was, we didn't get here overnight. And so this country led us here for a long time. I don't want us to forget that. So when we get past this, we don't let it happen again. I forgot to say that. <laughs> okay, uh, one of the first changes that I think we could uh, say that we need is change in our election system in this state. Yes. Jesus. Yeah. 46. <laughs> if anyone missed it, uh, Friday was the day that you had to register as a Democrat yeah. or forever hold your peace. <laughs> and uh, you cannot vote in next year's uh, primary. It's only 335 days away. Um, and we are first in the nation in that regard. So um, we are fortunate to have a very distinguished group of people here uh, who've been working on this issue really tirelessly uh, for a long time. Um, and we're going to start with, uh, uh, with Susan here. Susan Lernick, she goes, she has to leave. Uh, Susan is what's your title? Executive, Executive Director of Common Cause, uh, a great organization that's been around for a long time. And Susan's also one of the founders and leaders of the coalition called Easy Elections New York, of which NIPAN is a, uh, a big partner, uh, and uh, has been doing a lot of the lobby work on trying to change the election laws. So without further ado, uh, Susan Lerner. Thank you. And thanks to NIPAN for being such an important partner in the work that we're doing because the fact is, as Jermani and as Stephanie pointed out, the only way we're going to affect change is if we demand it. And this is particularly true in our election area because virtually all of the election authorities are perfectly comfortable with the system the way it works. The real hidden secret about New York's elections is unlike many places in the country, New York's election law prioritizes political parties over voters. The entire way in which our election administration is structured prioritizes political parties over voters. If you are somebody who has voted absentee, if you are somebody who, for whatever reason, your name wasn't in the book, had to file an affidavit ballot, what under federal law is called a provisional ballot, and you want to go in and you want to defend your vote and be That's sure it counts, and there are candidates fighting over your ballot before a court of law, you don't have any standing, because you're just the voter. You're not the political party, and you're not the candidate. And that, frankly, friends, to be very crude about it, is ass backwards. We need a system that puts us first. And that means we need to be showing up consistently. In a legislative system which, unfortunately, is not very welcoming to us, and it's not the fault of our colleagues here, our elected representatives, Brian Kavanaugh and uh, Bobby Carroll, who've been fighting hard for election reform, but the way in which our legislature works, there's no place for us to go and testify. So we've got to lobby, we've got to show up, we've got to do what we did this past uh, Thursday when we all got together in scary costumes <laughs> so that we could draw attention to the crazy deadline that George was talking about. There are very specific things that could be done 
to make our elections better. Some of them require legislative changes, some of them require constitutional changes, but some of them require nothing more than political will in a governor who's willing to do it and put some cash behind it. So in the Easy Elections Coalition, we've tried to prioritize the things that can get done right away and work on the long term on the things where we need constitutional change or more legislative change. And one of the things that we could do right away, which the goddamn state of Georgia managed to do, that progressive leading light, and that is we could have a system where when you go to a state agency, when you go to the DMV to change your, vote, your license, the system for voter registration could be, wait for it, opt out, hello, change the box that you check, right? Right now you have to opt in, okay? It's not an automatic system. In Georgia, they figured out that they could increase the voter rolls by changing the damn form at the DMV. <laughs> so that instead of saying, yes, I do want you to send my information to the election authorities, you have to say, I don't want you to send the forms to the election authorities. It is a truism, unfortunately, that most human beings are trapped in inertia. They don't pay attention to all of the forms. It's one of the reasons why we had so many issues with the check boxes on the uh, tax form for the presidential system. So if people have to opt out, most people don't pay attention to that detail and that means they're in. So in the state of Georgia, they increase the number of people on the voter rolls by hundreds of thousands of people with that very simple administrative change. We could do that here. The governor could easily do that. The governor, to his credit, set up a system of online voter registration that we did not have and which probably wouldn't have made it through the legislature, but he figured out it's an executive agency. It's called the Department of Motor Vehicles, and he could set it up through the DMV. So he could do the very same thing at almost no cost, and we could be an opt-out state. And let me tell you, what we're seeing in state after state, we now have 10 states with automatic voter registration that is more ambitious than what Georgia did. When you have automatic voter registration and you put hundreds of thousands of people on the voter rolls, some of them vote. It's that inertia I talked about. If you're already registered to vote and you get material about the elections, because now the candidates can find you, now NIPAN can find you and call you and text you, and knock on your door and say, hey, there's an important election in your neighborhood. Why don't you come out and vote? Here are the candidates. People will vote because they're registered already. That is something we could do immediately in New York. Early voting gets banned, gets blocked over and over again. Now, I have to say no one of these things is a magic silver bullet, and I can't promise that if we do X, Y, or Z for sure, we're going to get an upsweep in turnout and in voters, other than the automatic voter registration, which really does seem to bring more people out. But early voting is such a basic idea, particularly when we're talking about communities that are economically stressed. If you, it was great to hear some of the public opinion folks who were taking polls and doing focus groups, and they were asking questions like, what about your job makes it harder for you to vote? And how shocked these upper middle class pollsters were when the people they were talking to said, which job? I said, yeah, your job. And they said, which of the three keeps me from voting? Well, if you're, if you're working three jobs, then it's really hard to get to the polling place, even if it's open from 6 a.m. in the morning till 9 in the evening. So early voting helps, it absolutely does. And what we hear over and over and over again is, oh, we can't do it, it's too expensive for the counties. And there's no question that New York does not help its counties pay for elections. And there are unfunded mandates. But in so many other states, you know what? They help the counties. They put money in the budget. In Maryland, they had a big fight should there be early voting? And the legislature was saying what our legislature was saying, which is it's too expensive and the counties can't pay for it. And you know what the, the mayor did? The mayor, rather, the governor did? 
He put a modest amount, and in Maryland he put I think two or three million dollars in the budget just once to help get early voting started. And let me tell you, once you've got early voting, the people will demand that it stay. It's incredibly popular. So we could be doing the same thing. Governor Cuomo could be putting a relatively modest amount of money, and, and Brian Kavanaugh has done calculations as to how much that could be, comparatively speaking, for our state budget, just once to help the counties get it started. And then this objection of, oh, we can't pay for it, it's too expensive for the counties, would be gone. And we know who keeps putting it in his state of the state, and who keeps putting it in the executive budget and does nothing to fight for it, and that is our governor. And we are the people who need to make that change. We need to hold him responsible. It's an election year. It needs to be in a state of the state again. It needs to be in his executive budget, but he needs to fight for it, and we need to pass it. Those are two immediate things that we could see happen in 2018 would make a big difference for elections in our state. And I'm looking forward to working with all of you, both in the halls of power and out in the streets, to take this message forward. We're not going to stand for this situation where people are discouraged from voting in New York any longer. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, we're also honored to have here today uh, Assemblyman and soon-to-be Senator Brian Kavanaugh from Manhattan. Uh, Brian has actually uh, been on this issue, <laughs> I don't know how long. I mean, when you talk about election law and reforming it, Brian's name comes up all the time um, because he's been so involved with this issue. Um, you know, uh, some of you may know that um, there's, uh, you know, we talk about the electoral uh, college and trying to abolish it, and there is a movement uh, to do that, and it's called, um, um, what's the name? Yes. National Popular Vote, which states can opt into a system where they say that they will award their electoral votes to the winner of the popular vote, and it only becomes effective when states representing more than 270 electoral votes opt in. It's brilliant, brilliant idea. Um, problem is, you got to get it through Republican-controlled legislators. Uh, it's past California, it's past New York. Um, but the interesting thing about New York is, it's the only state that's passed this where one of the chambers was controlled by Republicans. I don't know how you did that, Brian. <laughs> and he wasn't even in the Senate. <laughs> But um, that just is a story that goes to show Brian's dedication to this issue. He is really uh, a champion of democracy. Uh, so without further ado, Brian Kavanaugh. Uh, thank you, George. And uh, you know, the, the um, increasing focus of NIPAN uh, on this issue, I think, is really a, a big uh, step in the right direction for this movement. Um, as I'm going to try to be brief here. I know we're a little bit behind schedule, and I'm hoping there'll be some Q&A as well. Some, I think I'm hoping we get a bit of a discussion going here as well, although I know we have a lot of great panelists. Um, so just at its most basic level, our election system in general in the US, and particularly in New York, is designed substantially to prevent, or to put at least to put significant obstacles between the electorate and uh, the moment when they actually cast a vote and have it counted. Um, New York, uh, I guess to our credit, to our limited credit, um, has avoided some of the very big steps backwards you've seen in the rest of the country. We've avoided uh, some extraordinarily aggressive uh, partisan and race-based gerrymandering um, that, has, uh, that is now going to the Supreme Court, although we have some gerrymandering, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we've avoided the really pernicious voter ID laws, which are expressly designed in various parts of this country to disenfranchise significant portions of the uh, electorate. Uh, having said that, though, we in New York have not modernized our system such that notwithstanding, I think, there's, there's not a whole lot of really ill intent in some of these laws that are in place when they were originally in place. But the net effect of a deeply broken election system in New York is about as bad, and some might argue worse, than what you see in systems where people actually set out to uh, prevent people from voting. 
from the moment you say, you know, you, where, where does this begin? It starts with uh, the line, the, in order to vote in our system, you need to be in a district. The lines are drawn uh, by the electoral majorities in each house. Uh, Effectively, as has already been mentioned, elect politicians select their voters rather than the other way around. Um, the assembly last time around more or less drew the lines in a manner similar to the previous lines, although those were drawn in prior generations uh, to meet certain interests of politicians. The Senate, uh, which was controlled by the Republicans at the time, and, uh, the time drew some really radically uh, problematic lines that are a substantial reason why the Republicans control the Senate to this day. They actually added a district. We had 62 districts. They added a 63rd one, which is now represented by a Republican and was tailor-made for that Republican to represent that area. Um, we, from the moment you as a voter begin to participate, um, it is incredibly difficult to get registered. It's incredibly difficult to stay registered. Um, that is a problem for all voters. It is particularly problem is problematic because it disproportionately falls on particular uh, portions of the electorate. Uh, people of color, Younger voters, students uh, are much more likely to move frequently. Uh, they're much more likely to have diffi difficulty getting on the rolls and staying on the rolls. Um, so, you know, we've got a range of proposals. But I'll mention. I'll sort of rattle through the, the proposals that we've been working on in a few minutes. Um, but just suffice it to say that that system, by virtue of being so difficult to engage with, disenfranchises enormous enormous number of voters in New York, and is the reason why, and a major reason why, we have such low levels of participation. Um, the system of elections itself, particularly in New York, uh, the actual way we administer the elections. Um, we have lines that are too long. We have poll workers who are inadequately trained, although there's some, you know, God bless those of you who are competent and you show up at the polls and you, you help uh, run the system. There are many, many good people in the system. But across the board, we have problems that are just a function of the system being poorly administered. At our central boards of election, we have you had that amazing thing in Brooklyn where tens of thousands of voters were purged. Um, it's really hard to believe it wasn't a conspiracy uh, to purge tens of thousands of voters. In fact, it just have seemed, seems to have been a level of incompetence that's just really hard to believe, but in fact, seems to have been what occurred there. Um, we have, uh, as has been mentioned, restrictions on how you register. Um, we have this deadline that just passed uh, that is the earliest deadline in America for, for uh, enrolling in a party. Uh, in order to participate. I know that's been a particular concern for people who wanted to engage around uh, you know, supporting Bernie Sanders who may not have been active members of the Democratic Party before. It also incidentally was a big problem for Trump voters who were, were uh, including uh, the children of a presidential candidate who are New York voters who are unable to vote for their father in the Republican <laughs> primary because our laws are so restrictive. Um, we have, uh, so, so I'm gonna, there's some good news here. Which is that I, I, I very frequently talk about uh, talk to, I've been talking with uh, Democratic uh, audiences on this for years and years and years, and I often say, you know, you like to think that the people that want to disenfranchise people are Republicans, that they, you know, they are trying to keep people out, and we as Democrats want to get everybody in. The truth is that for a long time, the powers that be within our own party have resisted changing these things. Um, and I will say that in the last few years, um, so I, I introduced many bills on the subject. Um, uh, when I got to this legislation in 2007, which a lot of bills in 2007, 2008, pushed for them, got some of them to move, some modest progress in some of them over the years. Um, but in, the, in recent years, I think there was a broad consensus among Democrats in our own state, in New York, that we ought to be moving these. And so in the last couple of years, the Assembly has passed bills that, first of all, allow you to begin by pre-registering when you're 16, uh, so that your registration automatically becomes active when, you're, when you turn 18. Um, we have automatic registration bill that we passed, and it, this is a critical, uh, this is something I want to emphasize. Uh, what Susan said about the possibility of doing this through DMV is very important. It is very, very important that we ensure that automatic registration is not <coughs> only a thing of the DMV. It has to be automatic registration through a wide range of public agencies, including public assistance agencies, including the Department of Labor, including the universities, including our public schools. And 
Abbott has now been the assembly's yeah. position for a few years. It's also the position of the mayor and the city controller and many other people have taken a position in this. Um, we are working on making that the position of the governor and are <coughs> making progress on that. Um, it is critical that we don't have a registration system that skews the electorate toward people who are fee-paying customers of the DMV, who are more likely to have cars, who are more likely to have driver's licenses. Really um, we have a bill that would allow straight up online registration, meaning you don't need to be going through a government agency, you can do the process online like you can do almost everything significant that you do in your life. Um, we have bills that would re-enfranchise uh, parolees uh, more immediately. Many people in this country can't vote because of the <laughs> And we have bills uh, to uh, ensure that uh, well, let me. I'm trying. I want to try, try to avoid getting into the weeds here. Um, we have we have we have bills that ensure that you can get a uh, a ballot uh, by mail without having some special reason to be outside the city when you're when it's time to vote. Um, that's we have one of the most restrictive system. That is uh, one of the things that would require a constitutional amendment, uh, which Susan mentioned would would require a couple of years to do. Um, there are a few elements that are missing from what the assembly has been willing to do. Um, one of them, uh, we, we still need to work on same day registration. Um, it is still, it is a constitution, well, the statute basically says you have to register 25 days before the election. Constitution says it has to be 10 days before. We ought to push the constitutional deadline. We ought to push the statutory deadline to the constitutional deadline. You should be able to, you should be able to register up to 10 days. By the way, the deadline of Friday would, if you change that, at least you'd be able to do it for a couple more weeks to register for this year. Um, we also ought to amend the Constitution to make same day registration. That has two advantages. One is it allows people who, you know, wake up on election day and they decide they want to participate and they can actually participate. Um, it also means that one of the big problems with our system is when there's an error in your registration and they can't find your name, which happens all too frequently, there's no way to fix that on election day right now because the deadline is passed, they can't just register. In a state where they have same day registration, it doesn't matter. If, I mean, it's better if you pre-register, you can, you know, smoother process, but you can fix that and anybody who wants to vote on, a, on election day who's eligible to vote can register. The other big thing that we're still working on is this, I mentioned it before, but the, um, and, and perhaps Bobby Carroll will talk about this, but the, this issue of the, the uh, party change having to be uh, way before um, the, uh, the deadline. It has to happen in the preceding year. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty crazy thing. It actually has, a, it has its roots in the 19th century. It was a reform, actually, originally. I won't get into the details of why they thought that was a good thing to do in the 19th century. Um, but it's long past due that you can register, that you can you know, ch choose a party uh, that is appropriate for you <coughs> and register and vote in it. Um, so a lot of this stuff, the, again, the assembly, which had not done this for many years, under the new speaker, has moved this package forward. Um, we have passed all of these bills. We have teed this up. This is one of these things that we can make major prog. We can make we can probably do the full package if we got a democratic control of the Senate. In the meantime, it is the case that the governor would have a lot of ability to do some of these things through the budget process. Uh, we mentioned early voting, uh, which I've been carrying for a few years. Uh, early voting, is the main argument you get against it is budgetary. You've got localities, <coughs> legitimately by the way, there are, there are counties in the <coughs> state that have a total of 5,000 residents, um, imposing on them the obligation to open poll sites around their county uh, is you know, potentially a significant fiscal thing. There is no reason why the state of New York can't be subsidizing the need for every New Yorker to participate in the democracy. It is peanuts in the, in the context of a, budget, a state budget that exceeds $140 billion, and it is something that we ought to get done next year with the help of uh, both houses of the legislature and the governor. I think I will stop there, um, and I look forward to uh, discussing this with you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is a first-time assemblyman. Um, uh, he uh, is representing the 44th Assembly District, which I used to be in until they redistricted me <laughs> to the 52nd District. Um, but um, Bobby Carroll uh, has uh, been president of the Central Brooklyn Independent Dems, uh, and uh, had that club in an area that was pretty much pro-Hillary, endorsed Bernie Sanders. And it was, uh, Bobby did a ton of work trying to get him on the ballot. And uh, we didn't have many Democratic clubs helping us out. But Bobby, Bobby's club was one of them. So, uh, and he's now on the uh, Assembly Election Committee, and he has some great ideas about improving our, our system. Bobby Carroll. Thank you so much, George. Uh, thank you, Tracy. 
uh, and all of you for being here today. Um, Susan and Brian touched on a whole slew of ideas, all of them very, very good. I don't want to regurgitate them. Um, one thing that I do want to say, though, is that one of the big things that we need to do to make sure that we have better elections is that we have competitive elections. And that's where all of you step in. Because what we do need is to do the hard work of organizing uh, individuals in all 150 assembly districts and 63 state senate districts so that we have people putting these issues to the forefront and either getting your current assembly member or state senator to sign on to these ideas or to run somebody against them. And that's the big problem with our electoral system is that we have non-competitive elections. And that's partially due to our election laws and partially due to voter apathy. And we need to fight both of those. Uh, one of the things that Brian touched on that I think is very, very important is our enrollment deadlines. If you look at the states that have the most uh, voter participation rates, all of them actually, they all share only one thing, and that is very, very uh, simple and easy voter registration laws so that you can either register to vote the day of or within basically a week or 10 days of the election, and that there's almost no uh, barriers to changing one's party enrollment. Um, they, if you take those five states, and I forget off the top of my head the five states, if you look at them, uh, not all of them have uh, early voting. If you look at them, not all of them have a campaign finance system. Uh, not all of them. They don't share anything else except that. Uh, and of course, the reason why that makes sense, if you think about it, is because, well, people start paying attention at the end of elections, and suddenly they say, hey, I want to go vote for person X or Y, let me go uh, see if I can register. And then when they find themselves pushed away, you've lost a voter sometimes for life. Because a big thing, like anything that's new, uh, and to create habits, is that you want easy access. Because if your first experience trying to vote is you can't vote, well, you're much more likely to say, you know what, maybe that's not for me. And we need to stop that. That's why one of the bills I have that I'm most excited about is a bill that would lower the voting age in New York for state municipal elections to 17 and also create basically a voter ed, kind of like a driver ed, driver's ed for 16 and 17 year olds. And you'd be registered in high school. Uh, it's insane that we uh, are supposedly preparing young people for life and for college and high school. And we don't prepare them to be civically engaged at all. Uh, this is one of the most important skills to a well-functioning democracy. And if we are not training our young people to go and vote and be active in their neighborhoods and in their towns and cities, we are not properly educating them. Uh, and the unfortunate thing is, so many people think that voting is uh, once every four years in November. And we all know if that's what you think, you're doing it wrong. Because it's every year. And that's what we need to instill in our young people. Another big, big problem in our system uh, is that Albany, unfortunately, is a craven, self-serving place where the interests of party leadership come well before even just the duly elected members of those bodies. And so we need to make sure that we have more members who are willing to be independent and act on their own because it is the leadership of both houses that are not looking to upend the apple cart. I mean, simple, simple electoral reforms have taken years to get passed, and most of them are very, very modest changes. They would be great, but they are in no way um, you know, forward-thinking proposals. Uh, or would, would, you know, you know, they would still be far, far behind other states. So I could go into uh, a whole slew of things between how we run our special election system and how it differs between on a state level to a city level uh, and how we should adopt the city program to our campaign finance system that allows for tons of corporate money to come into our elections because of loopholes uh, through our LLC laws um, to you know, early voting, same-day registration, no-fault absentee voting, things Susan and Brian touched on very effectively. But I know that all of you have questions and ideas, and I think we should open it up to that so that we can have this discussion uh, and breakout session. Thank you all so much for being here also. Okay, uh, before we open up the questions, though, I wanted to uh, allow um, one of our uh, younger members in Queens, Kenny Shelton, uh, to uh, speak from the perspective of a young uh, voter, 
trying to negotiate the system because Kenny and many like him are the victims of this system, as, as we've seen. Because as uh, the speakers have said, these voting laws tend to exclude younger people, students, people of color, and a far, far greater percentage than any other voter. Oh, the people who would have voted for Bernie. Um, so um, Kenny uh, has a lot of perspective for, uh, as a student, uh, and um, I want you to say a few words. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Um, I want to preface this, though, but before I'm young, I'm black. Um, I don't get pulled over by the police because I'm young. I get pulled over because I'm black. Um, and so as a student going here, um, it's important to understand and educate yourselves. Um, so unlike what might be talked about here in the normal, I'm going to give you guys the truth. Um, and Hubert Harrison talked about this before. He said politically, uh, the Negro is the touchstone of democracy. And so by looking at the position of the black community, you can understand how our democracy works. And so it's kind of ironic um, near the anniversary of Fannie Lou Hamer's uh, birth that we're still talking about election reform. Um, and so I'm going to sit up here and tell you a, a little story. Um, I was in Southeast Queens holding a, a, a barbecue with my colleague Kim and some of my, my friends and family members. And a white woman comes up to me and says, and asks, what are some of the most important issues in you know, the black community? Right, that's a loaded question. I don't think I have to explain to her. When you can see black people dying on Twitter, you can see black people dying on Facebook. Uh, and black people love mass incarceration, so like, that's an easy issue. And she says to me, you have to get your priorities straight. The most important issue is the IDC. <laughs> you see, that's the problem right there. When we talk about election reform, it is a white issue. It is a very white issue. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That when you talk about getting money out of politics, when you talk about gerrymandering, when you talk about registering people to vote, you ignore the fact that my people were three-fifths, that my people couldn't vote, and that we marched for the right to vote. But let me connect those dots, and I'm going to pass off to Austin to give you some specifics. There are some ways we can coalesce. Because when you talk about money in politics, who has the money? Who doesn't have the money? And why don't black people have the money? That's the question. So I have to ask, are we doing this up here for recognition or for the results? And so, the next challenge, I think, of the black community, and I'll, I'll, I'll move this forward, the next challenge of our black community is taking the issue of police brutality and stretching it to how the black community is devalued in all social, political, and economic spheres in this country. And so when you're talking about election reform, you lose me, but you can bring me back. Because you can connect election reform to the cause for justice because they are one and the same. Whether Democrat, Republican, IDC, racism is a bipartisan, tripartisan affair. But I think it's greatly articulated in what Malcolm X called, it. it's ironic, you know, people never really bring up Mal Malcolm X, they always bring up Martin Luther King. In the ballot or the bullet, in which last year, and next year, because I know y'all gonna come to my community next year, and say, hey, you know, against Cuomo, against some of these other Republicans, <laughs> or some of these other Democrats, come on, black people, we need y'all. Come vote for this other white guy, because he's better than this white guy. And what's the worst part about that at all is that we can fix the laws, we can fix the gerrymandering process. We can elect better representation. We can have same day voter registration. And I still won't get any justice. You see, here in Queens, I know not all of you are from Queens, but the party machine is controlled by a white man. 
Joseph Crowley, he was just here the other day. The people who are in power are white. And trust me, I know white people better than they know themselves. You don't have to go far in your family to find racism the same way I don't have to go far in my family to find poverty. <clears throat> so I'm going to pass this off to Austin, but I want to, want to say this. When we're talking about reforming democracy, we have to first talk about how black people are negatively impacted by these systems. <clears throat> so that when you're coming to our communities and talking about, hey, we need same-day voter registration, we also understand that black people, as a voting bloc, we vote. You connect that to the issue of, well, you can't vote during these hours because you work two jobs. So if we have same-day voter registration, you can vote for this person who is going to give you the self-determination so that you don't live in those circumstances. And that when we talk about money and politics, we're running a grassroots campaign, and we're trying to boot that money out because you have less of a voice because of historic discrimination. Now we're talking about term limits. This is something that I hold dearly. The politicians that sell my community out that look like me. Let's have increased competition. Not handouts, but justice. So Austin, if you want to get up here. How you doing, Sister Nancy? Uh, I'm uh, president of St. Albans Civic over in St. Albans, Queens, and uh, also vice president of an organization called Community First. Um, wonderful, wonderful presentation. I think you're, you're talking about issues that are very important. And Brother Kenneth and I, about these issues, uh, now we, the black problem, I mean, the black issue is a very difficult issue. I'm not expecting everyone to understand that issue, that's, that's very heavy. But as far as the issues that we all share in this room, uh, it sounds like a, a vote yes for the Constitutional Convention in three weeks would be a hell of a solution. Because you, you can't be scared of what other people can do. You have to talk about your own power. And if you're talking about your own power, even if you vote no, you still might have to deal with it. Are you prepared? Do you have your issues and your agendas straight? Do you have your own topics that you want to push? Because again, just voting no and going to sleep is not the answer. We have to be prepared. So uh, we, we, I mean, when you talk about things like uh, 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 correcting uh, redistricting, right? You can actually have that controlled by communities where citizens determine uh, what their boundaries are, right? So we can, we can do that immediately ourselves. We don't actually have to wait for legislature. Am I right? I think I am. When you talk about uh, term limits. <laughs> now that's one thing you, you could wait till you're blue in the face. You're never going to get legislation to push through. You're going to have to do that yourself. And I know there are concerns about certain uh, pension rights that are being pushed by union groups. But let's that not forget the idea of collective bargaining was attained through a constitutional convention in New York State. That the con constitutional convention of 19, in the 1930s got us collective bargaining. Right? We did that ourselves. You're not going to be able to get politicians to do that. And um, I'm speaking to you here as, as the people. Because this is not a con the conversation you should actually even have with elected officials. That's the reason why it's on the ballot by itself. This is a way for you to determine whether your, your elected officials have been effective or not. Because now you can take the power into your own hands. Now, again, I'm going to vote yes. I'm not telling you to vote yes, but I am telling you <laughs> to, to I mean, I'm telling you to be prepared. You should always have it, already have your agenda prepared so you can push forward this, because whether it happens or not, whether it happens or not, <laughs> uh, it's like I, I use the, the, the military analogy. When you go to war, you have to have all of your, all of your, your bullets in your gun. You know, you don't, you don't uh, go in there half cocked. But again, I'm not going to, <laughs> I didn't expect to speak today, so I'm not going to go on to ever for too long. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you. Have a good luck. Okay.
One thing I love about this organization, we don't, uh, we don't uh, shy away from different opinions on issues. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's um, open it up for questions to any of our panelists. Uh, yes, sir. You want to identify yourself? So we, your name and where you're from? Uh, my name is Jim Forad. I live in Greenwich Village. I'm from the downtown. Uh, Great, welcome. With, with Mr. Schwartz. Um, I wanted to ask about lobbyists in the Democratic Party machine and positions of power. And, um, you know, we, we've had a the vice president of the New York Democratic Party, full time lobbyist. She's been there for years. We have a recent uh, controversy about Keith Wright, and it just is shocking to people I talk to that they don't believe that a lobbyist could be an official in the Democratic Party. So if anyone would like to talk about this, because I think this does affect voting reform. Anyone want to take that on? Susan? Well, as a registered lobbyist, uh, I feel qualified to uh, to speak on that. <laughs> I am. I'm a registered lobbyist. That's one of the things that I do as the executive director of Common Cause New York. But I do think that there is a very big difference um, in uh, lobbyists who are in positions of power in our uh, political parties. And I think that that is something that should be directly addressed <coughs> by the party. We've raised questions particularly about Keith Wright's double role. Um, we think that it raises a big conflict uh, in a party official who has power over uh, the party's support for particular uh, candidates and <clears throat> elected officials, um, who is simultaneously lobbying different uh, governmental bodies uh, and is able to use both his power in the party for the benefit of private clients. And we think that that's a conflict. And we hope that the Democratic Party in Manhattan is capable of addressing that in some intelligent way. But it goes back to what I said previously, which is our election laws give too much power to the political parties that are not, unfortunately, responsive to the people they are supposed to represent, as Brother Kenneth pointed out. And that's, I think, an issue for all of us as activists. What we expect from the parties, and how we interact and what we demand of them and what can be done internally. It's gonna be really interesting to see what happens with the party rules committee uh, in Manhattan. There is supposedly a three month uh, examination of what's going to happen and allegedly there are going to be some suggestions made. We are taking a look at common cause in terms of what we think could be done in this regard. And I'm trying to get a hold, and maybe actually Bill Samuels might have a copy of this. In 1967 or 68, the New York Democratic Party asked Ted Sorensen to put together a committee and make recommendations for change. One of the things he recommended was doing away with county chairs. I'm trying to get ahead. I'm trying to get a hold of that uh, report. I think we may have to go up to the Kennedy Library in Boston to get Ted's copy. Uh, but when we have our hands on it, we're going to release it again and see what recommendations were made back then. Uh, Ty, and then the Assemblywoman. Just like you have the people, uh, the three million currently today. So if, if you could all address that. Yeah. 
So one of the things that we've suggested in an automatic voter registration system is that you have more than one opportunity to opt out, okay? Um, and that you are uh, able at the agency or when you're interacting with whatever agency to opt out. But you then get a separate notice that says you're on the voter rolls and here's your opportunity to register for a party. But if the party doesn't fix the problems, we're gonna see a continuation of what we currently have, which is a third of the electorate chooses not to register. Yeah, I, just, I would just add, I think there are, there are two distinct problems there. One is you have millions of people that are unregistered at all, and I think that there are many problems with our election system, but if you do not address that, you're just not, you're just not you know, functioning in a, in a democracy. I mean, if you have that many people who can't vote. Um, there are a lot of ways to deal with the fact that uh, people don't, uh, they don't register the party, they don't know the implication of that. One thing is that the Board of Elections routinely sends notices to people about you know, when elections are coming around, it would be very easy to modify those to say, you know, you are not registered in a party. The implica like, brief implication of that. There are, there are proposals to say when you register and you don't do a party, you immediately get a notice that says, you know, you didn't register the party here, the implication of that. There are provisions to allow you to alter that, uh, you know, to sort of, a, a sort of second chance to add yourself to a party. There are a lot of ways to do that, but don't let, let's, you know, automatic registration, it, 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 it doesn't solve all the problems, it's not perfect, but getting that done will add millions of people who are currently invisible to the electoral system to the electoral system, and it, it's a core critical thing that we need to do irrespective of whether we can solve all the problems. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, don't go Wait, you ask someone uh, if they're registered to vote, and they say yes. I say, well, what party are you registered in? Oh, I'm independent. And I say to them, you're not registered to vote. Because 90% because of all the elections are determined after the primary, right? And people from out of state, they don't, get, they don't understand how this, that, how this is. So actually, uh, Assemblyman Carroll had a bill that would change the registration form, that would put in large letters, right now it's, uh, you, the box that you check for your party registration, I mean, you have to have really good eyesight to, to, to check that box. It would have in bold print, stop. <laughs> if you want to vote in a party primary, you must check that party's box. That, well, you can't miss it. Because a lot of people, well, there's, first of all, there's 500,000 people registered as an independence party. That's because they love their program and they think they're, huh. <laughs> they think they're independent, right? Yeah. So, I mean, this is just fraud on the voters. That's what it is. They're perpetrating a fraud. And hit, Bobby's bill would, would, uh, would do something about that. Uh, Assemblywoman, I love calling you that. We agree on that. talk a little bit more about um, in the next legislative session um, with um, our move to the Senate and our package of legislation going over and stalling in the Senate this legislative session, what do you feel like um, the trajectory of what is our strategy for getting it through a Republican Senate and Brian, I'm just, you know, for you perhaps, um, and actually getting this to the governor's desk, you know, to finally be, you know, signed into into law. You know, how do you feel like we can be best of service to um, to make this happen? You know, on the other side, we know that we, you know, in the assembly support this. We know that we we have it. You know, how how can we move this through the Senate to get it? I, I, so the the long term answer, if you want to address the range of problems we're talking about, and you know, and Bobby could have added, you know, obviously campaign, the campaign finance system and some other aspects of this that are deeply broken. The long term answer, if we really want to get to a you know a very high quality election system, is 
that we're going to need to elect some more Democrats to the Senate, and then we're going to have to create a functioning progressive Democratic majority in the Senate um, if you want to solve the, the wide range of these. Short term, though, I don't, I don't believe in waiting. Um, the best mechanism to get key things done on this area, and especially in the area of election administration. So you talk about campaign finance reform. Uh, the Senate has demonstrated that they are willing to take on enormous political cost uh, to refuse to do things that everybody uh, wants to do, that every reasonable person thinks we can do, like, for example, closing the LLC loophole, which some of you probably know about, and it's a bill that I've been pushing through the assembly for many years, and my predecessor, well, the, the person whose seat I am seeking in the Senate, Daniel Squadron, has basically banged the Republicans over the head with that for years, and they were willing to resist on that. With election reform, it's a little trickier for the Republicans because there is a broad constituency for reforming election laws that is not particularly partisan. So you talk about reforming the campaign finance system, the base of the Republican Party does not believe in, uh, in, in public campaign finance. There's a, there's a core base there that thinks you're using taxpayer money for politicians. It's easier for them to resist that. With something like early voting, everybody thinks it should be early voting, Republicans, Democrats. So the resistance ought to be lower, and the, the mechanism to do it is through the budget. The governor proposes, as I think Susan mentioned earlier, the governor proposes doing these things through the budget each year. He has a big address. He says these are critical, they're essential things. They're in the state of the state, the big address. And then they are, there are bills that are introduced as part of the budget package. What we need to do is make sure that the governor introduces these in, a su in such a way that they are essential parts of the budget, that you can't pass the budget without passing early voting and without funding it. If we do that, and this is, the, you know, the governor's, governor's budget gets introduced in January. This is a process, this is something we should be pushing for now. Um, the governor has also pushed uh, automatic voter registration through the DMV in the budget. Um, again, I would strongly urge us to push for it to be multi-agency, not just the DMV, but again, getting that in the budget and saying we're going to fund it and we're going to implement it in the budget by April 1st. Uh, those would both be enormous steps forward. And then you're challenging the Republicans, you know, do you want to refuse to pass the budget uh, because you're refusing to do those things? Uh, you're not even you're not even doing something that's popular in your own party, and I think we can get it done. Especially, I think we get early voting in the short term. I have a slightly different take on that. Why don't we run someone against the governor? Let's see how he responds. Um, Stephen, and then Nancy. First, I want to say thank you. Um, but I do want to add a little bit more nuance on that. Um, I'm not really interested in you guys organizing in my communities. Uh, my communities, I'd rather prefer you organize in yours. Um, because in the fight against Democrats and Republicans, those are your family members. I know white people at Thanksgiving, you have the racist uncle, the racist grandparent, that's just how it goes. So you'd be better off servicing and going in your communities and fighting for these things. And we can coalesce around that. And so I want to say that, according to the last question, this, as Oster said, this can be solved by a constitutional convention. I'm of the belief of my freedom being attained by any means necessary. And when you have that freedom right in front of you, you should go out there and take it. You see, the problem is, after 400 years of slavery, I'm still waiting for my freedom. And right now, we have, we're sitting in a perfect situation to go out there and grab it. I'm a young person, so I don't have a pension. I'm not in a union, so those things don't affect me right now. Um, but even if I did, I think, Austin, what is it? I'll get tier six? Yeah, yeah that's not a good pension. Um, and so I think there's a movement around us wanting change and adequate change. And that starts with white people going to your communities, organizing around our issues, 
us coalescing, and I think we have a really unique moment to coalesce around the Constitutional Convention, um, outlining all these things and really getting justice for our communities. And I'm not of the opinion that we have to wait for a legislator to do it. We should go through the mainstream democracy, which is the Constitution right there. Thank you. Okay, this has to be the last question because we have two other uh, panels. So uh, I, I recognize Nancy. Um, and I want to say one thing and then I want to ask a question, and that is about pensions. I'm living on a pension now, and I hope you can eventually live on a pension too. We want to expand pensions, we don't want to reduce pensions. So we're not going to Yeah, I mean, that, that's cool. I think it's good. I think it's a great idea. Um, but you have to ask yourself, for what though? Like, I'm gonna register people in my community for what? I mean, there's a whole lot of people registered in Rikers Island right now. So I think we have to look at what are we getting our people in our community to vote for? Um, and so it's not just a message of having them voting, because black people, we vote, right? We came out for Obama, right? We came out for Hillary, and we still don't have anything. So I think we have to really go beyond just the intermediate steps and really start engaging about what are things that black people, brown people, and white progressives really can coalesce around in voting for actual justice. Um, thank you. Um, you know, I, I agree with you, Kenneth, but we actually, we don't vote. Uh, and that's the real problem. If you look at our assembly districts, state senate districts, city council districts, um, and you look at them, it, this crosses demographic lines, income lines. You're having four, five, six, seven, ten thousand people in districts where there's between 140 and 350,000 people voting. Uh, and that is the fundamental problem. And I agree also with you, Kenneth, that oftentimes uh, the reform, with, however you want to say it, the reform movement uh, of our election laws is oftentimes a white, wealthy uh, demographic. Um, and that does need to change, because good elections affect all of us. One of the reasons why we have such bad elected officials, the reason why we have such problems in Albany, and one of the reasons why I think we would have such problems in a constitutional convention, is because our system is set up uh, to stop people from voting of all backgrounds. Uh, and the only way to change that um, is to get education and to make sure that the next generation of people have as many of the tools as possible so that they can have self-determination. It will not be perfect. It will have differences between racial and economic lines. There will be problems uh, and there will be fault lines, but I think we shouldn't be um, so cynical that we say, let's not at least try. Uh, you know, I am optimistic that if we do that, we will have a better democracy going forward. Okay, I'm sorry, we have to wrap it up now. We have two other panels coming on. Uh, I want to thank all our participants uh, of this panel. This is really incredible diversity of uh, tactics and views, and uh, I think uh, I've learned a lot, and I hope you have too. <laughs>